Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting via Skype with Joey Sturgis. How are you, mate? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? I am marvellous. Um, got, I got a little bit of a slow start here this morning with the kids and everything. And you are in Michigan, you'd said, in a log cabin with loads of land in the middle of nowhere. That That's correct. Fantastic. Yeah, this is my my special little getaway from all the stress and stuff. Um, I do a lot of my work out here, and I'm, I've been here for about two years, and I really like it, so doing well. So what's your sort of nearest city? The bands fly in, and they drive to you? Yeah, a lot of the bands that I work with you know, um, are often on tour probably about 200 days out of the year, so they're really used to traveling and just being in new spots, and I think they also see this as a little bit of an oasis uh, to get away from all the distractions and stuff uh, so they can really focus on their art. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think of lots of sort of records over the years that were made that way. I think it no longer exists, but you remember that studio, Pachyderm? Was, yeah. That was one of those things. I only did one record there, but we went there specifically because we were trying to get the artist who was, who was a little girl crazy, should we say? So, you know, at night we'd lose him and maybe he wouldn't come in the next day. So we went <laughs> there, no car, He's just like, <laughs> same kind of idea in the middle of nowhere and you just focus on your art. And, uh, and yeah, I get it. And it works really well. Yeah, if you're an artist, you, you, you also want that place where it's only about your music. Yeah, and I think that um, the, uh, the whole concept of like being far away from the city and, and not being able to uh, sort of access your cell phone at times can really kind of lead you to that place where you have to let go of everything and you have to just your your mind starts to wander and that's where people get come up with really cool ideas i find because if you really have to do the whole city thing and then you know your inspiration and your creativity is is sort of at the snap of a finger um i feel like you can't get very deep into uh into like the emotional side of, of a good track and so that's been really beneficial. And the other thing too, is that I'm also not too far away from things. So I can have extra help come in or we can take a little drive to another studio if we need to mic up something really big. Um, so yeah, it's good to be out here. And I'm sure, you know, li living in the Midwest, your overhead is probably a, a fraction of uh, us over here. So you can really do a lot. Yeah. I, you know, I, I tell people this and they, uh, they often want to put a gun to their head. <laughs> the the rent or well, the mortgage here is fifteen hundred a month, and I've got three thousand five hundred square feet. So, uh, quite a different uh, thing in comparison to LA. Yeah, let's just say mine's considerably higher than that for a house a lot smaller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I do love the sunshine. I think for being English, you know, I grew up in the in the rain. It rained every single day and. Pretty much. So to be in LA is kind of lovely. Where did you uh, Where did you grow up? So I grew up in Indiana. I lived there for about 26 years. And then uh, around 27, to age of 27, 28, somewhere in there, I kind of moved to Michigan. Uh, I often recorded in a really small garage that my friend had. And I was renting it from him for $500 a month. And that's how I really cut my teeth uh, doing my first couple of records. And then I made enough money to where I could sustain a house and bought a house there and started doing records in the house. And then eventually it just became a situation where some of the bands that I was working with were, you know, moving to LA and here I am still this little, you know, dude in Indiana. And the last thing they want to do is leave LA and come to Indiana and record an album. So I kind of had to move somewhere where there was at least a few restaurants and, and right. you know, some movie themes and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I, I mean, I've got, I live in, I live in Laurel Canyon, so you can't really walk anywhere I am. So it's probably similar really to just being where you are. It's not like, I think there are some studios in LA, uh, like Sunset Sound and United, the classic old studios that I suppose the bands could go out and walk down the street, but I don't, I don't often see them do that anyway, so. It sounds like you've got an amazing setup there. Um, and in fact, tell me what you've got. What do you? I, we can't really do a, a physical studio tour, of course, um, unless you want to pick up your laptop and move it around. But but what's uh, what is what is sort of your main mic pre's and mics, etc. Your sort of basic setup for say drums, obviously, is that would be the most. Yeah. So 
mostly what I work with here is is anything that's after drums, oh, like post production, right. vocals, guitars, all that kind of stuff. If if I have to do drums, I go somewhere else uh, where they have a lot more gear than nice. I do. But my basic setup is pretty much the the most minimum amount of stuff that you need to record. So I have uh, an API 3124. I have a, a Great River and uh, an RME Fireface 800 and two pairs of Atom A7Xs. And that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm mostly in the box. I don't do a lot of outboard EQing or compression compressing. Uh, I pretty much use all plugins and I record everything as dry and as sterile as possible so that I can go into the computer and manipulate it to the maximum degree. Um, so you could say that, you know, my albums are, are very, very, very much um, planned and, and, and uh, constructed rather than uh, vibey and kind of uh, discovery. Sure. That's great though. Um, I mean, everybody I know is increasingly mixing in the box and with, and not just, you know, guys like yourself that have come up in a time closer to that, but like guys of my age and, and even guys much older than me now are mixing entirely in the box. It's interesting. And I think, um, like you said, you go to a real studio, a big studio, so we say, a big studio. Every stu- These days, anything with a pair of monitors and, you know, a microphone and a basic mic pre is a real studio as far as I'm concerned. And you know what? To be honest, going on one of my famous tangents, it always has been. Because I remember the first time I ever worked with Jack Douglas, we we were we couldn't get into the studio we were working on that day. And the owner said, do you just want to use my office? And the assistant engineer was like, you can't do that. That's not a proper studio. And Jack Douglas is like, I did most of rocks, you know, Aerosmith rocks in a house, you know. So you don't have to go back very far to know that people were always just doing whatever they could to make great music. And you know, I'd argue Aerosmith Rocks is one of the greatest sounding records of all time. So if they did a lot of it in a house, you know, it's good enough for them. It's good enough for us, you know. So it sounds like you have a great setup. Um, tell me a little bit about all of the stuff you do, because um, the more I discover about you, the more layers there are. I thought I was busy, but it seems you're equally, if not more so busy. So look, there's a big banner yeah. behind you. It says Joey Sturgis Tones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got back from a. Uh... Not necessarily a trade show, but something uh, we did like an education conference at the uh, Alternative Press APMA's award show. They have an education conference in the morning where people come in and sort of learn about the audio industry and various facets from managers to booking agents to audio producers and et cetera. So uh, I have this set up here because I I am just kind of unpacking all my stuff from the show. But um yeah, I do a lot of different things. Uh, Joey Sturgis Tones, to start with, is my uh, audio software company. We make audio plugins. Um, our approach to the plugins is to sort of try and break down that technical barrier between musicians and audio gear. Uh, because, you know, you show a compressor to a guitar player and it's like they're looking at uh, a German dictionary or something. They just don't get it. And there's a lot of people out there that are so creative and, and really deserve to be able to uh, tap into that creativity Absolutely. in the recording environment. Yeah. So I try to make my plugins very simple to use. They require really no technical knowledge um, and just allow people to find interesting sounds um, through the uh, through the plugins. That's amazing. Uh, no, another thing I do is I have a, uh, a website called nailthemix.com and we basically what we wanted to try and do is figure out how can we teach people how to mix music and this was a big problem to tackle because if you think about it if i if i try to show you how to mix music with a single song you're really only going to learn a few things um because mixing is never you know every song is a little different every song requires a little bit of a different approach requires a different set of tools even in some cases sure. so Absolutely. yeah so for nail the mix we we sat down and we're like okay the only way this is really going to work is if we can constantly change the songs up and so uh we made it a monthly subscription fee where you get a new song every month 
Um, you download the multi tracks and you get to test your hand at actually mixing something that's been recorded properly. I think there's a lot of people out there who don't really have access to properly recorded tracks. And so they're not even really tapping into their full mixing potential sure. because they're always working on stuff that, you know, has been recorded like on a, maybe a crappy interface or using a guitar that's not so well you know tuned and and etc so we wanted to give people access to the right kind of files so that you could really see what your true uh, mixing potential is and then at the end of every month uh we mix the song live we do a little broadcast we got all these camera angles and stuff and you get to watch us mix the song and kind of compare how uh how you do it to how we do it and maybe learn something from that and we do q and a's and uh all this good stuff and we also built a community around this whole thing so all the members can access each other talk to each other and lately we've we've seen a cool uh, little community surge where uh, people are offering to like do editing for each other for free sure. um so there's a little bit of a trade uh going on there which we're really proud of i i love that idea um i love being able to provide you know properly recorded tracks and the same kind of thing, when I do it, I, I do all different environments. I've had stuff that's been done on tape and transferred to Pro Tools. I've had stuff that was done in my studio's pretty, you know, small live room, and then added a lot of samples to make the drums sound huge when they're small. And then I've done big drums and big room. And yeah, I, I love that idea. It gives everybody an option to, you know, see what it's like in the real world. And as you were just touching on when the camera died, um, you know, the whole... There's no set path anymore. Almost every successful producer and engineer and mixer of the last, up until like 10 or 20 years ago, almost all of them were like assistant engineer, engineer, producer, you know, maybe the engineer turns into a mixer, maybe a producer, maybe both, whatever. But they all sort of like acquired these credits by, you know, plugging in mics and running for coffee and then developing into engineers. And, and there was a beauty to it, of course, because they're in the room with, a great engineer or producer and they're picking up tips and they're seeing how that, you know, we interact with our musicians and stuff. So there was a lot of great things about it, but, you know, increasingly those kind of potential jobs are dying fast, you know, the, especially in a town like LA where the overhead, as we were joking about earlier, is so high. It's hard for a studio to maintain that kind of, yeah, to, to even stay in business, quite frankly. It's only the yeah, classic, and, you know, I, I feel like uh, some people might think, you know, that we're trying to replace school or something. And I, I really don't look at it that way. I think it's more of a supplement thing because, you know, there's there's a lot of things to learn out of school. There's a lot of things to learn at an internship. Sure. But there's also a lot of things in those two scenarios that you don't learn. And that's what I feel like we're providing is that really that Absolutely. gap. We're filling in all the gaps that aren't being filled currently. Yeah. And at a fraction of the cost of what a school would cost as well. I mean, I, I, do, I do love education, um, but uh, now at my age, I would actually go back to school to learn something new. Let's just say I wanted to, um, like my father's a painter, he's an artist, and I did do art college stuff, but if I really wanted to expand on that, I'd be fine to go back to an amazing college. But I'm in that place in my life where I'm all about the learning, and I, don't, I, I have a lot more patience to do that kind of stuff. When I was 20 to 25 years old, I wanted it now. You know, I wanted to know. I wanted the immediacy. And the thing about, you know, this world of, you know, the internet, cell phones, whatever, you know, is you can find it. You can find the information you need. And while you're like young and hungry and, you know, want to get from A to B fast, I don't know. I think at school would school makes sense now probably later in my life than it did when I was younger, frankly. Not that yeah, I'm knocking it, any schools, because that's not fair, I, I think. <laughs> well, I think the nature of the beast, though, is that schools just move at a really slow pace. And that's just sure. because there's so many factors that go into the whole thing. Um, and uh, especially with schools that are involved with government funding and, and stuff. So there's a bureaucracy and uh, a hierarchy to all of it. Uh, but what what's really cool, I think, about um, the internet right now and, and all these services and things is that you can you get access to all this stuff pretty much immediately uh, sure. and the delivery systems we have you know such as the video streaming and 
being able to do podcasts and smartphones, being able to watch this stuff on smartphones, like absolutely to, you know, when you're on the subway on the way to work or whatever it is, uh, really is kind of creating a whole new generation of audio production and, uh, producers and engineers and things. Uh, and I think we're going to see, I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of at that point where technology is, is making it easier, uh, for the plugins to sound really good and for the albums to sound really good. And now I'm seeing a, a huge surge of uh, independence in terms of the creation process. I see bands doing their own albums. Um, there's a band in my scene called Bring Me the Horizon. They just produced their new album uh, on their own. And it's one of their, I think it's their best selling album. Um, and that's a, that's, that's pretty cool because in the past they've worked with people like David Bendis and, and other bigger producers. And uh, it's just so nice to see that creators are now able to kind of do this on their own. And part the question of my I would ask, sort of empower that. Yeah, the question I would ask is, did they engineer it on their own? They did. That's, the, that's, the, big, that's the big thing, because you and I know that you know, you're a skillful engineer. I've been doing this a long time. I, I'm a great engineer. There's lots of great engineers we know. That you know, bands will produce on their own, but traditionally, all they would they would make sure they hired a guy that would always get the tones, that would do all that stuff. But when if they're engineering it and producing on their own, that's a huge step. That's like that's a big yeah. I think yeah, like part of my point is that now we're in a place where some of these bands have an engineer in the band. Great, Um, amazing. Bring Bring Me the Horizon in particular has uh, a member. I think his name is Jordan Fish. Uh, ho- hopefully I didn't get that wrong, but uh, he, I'm pretty sure that he engineered the album, probably even edited it as well. I don't think they mixed the album on their own, but there's bands like um, Thrice, for example. Thrice did all their own stuff as well, and they mixed their own album too. Sure. Um, so I, I just see that coming more and more, and uh, I, I just want to be, I want to be one of the the people who helps empower those creators and that's kind of part of the mission with JST is to create products that do that and also nail the mix to create people who can you know uh we we have a lot of members that are in their own band and so we want them to be able to mix their own album yeah no that's fantastic i I agree I, i i have that philosophy is like if you have any digital medium again picking up the cell phone i mean you can make music you really can. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the great leveler. It's the great leveler. And there's a part of me, I'll be really, really blunt. Uh, there's a part of me that loves it because, because I didn't come up the traditional way and I was always like clawing to kind of get noticed, especially in an industry in the 90s when I started where it was like, hmm, I can't think of a polite way of putting it. It's very, um, you know, um, everybody's friends were getting the gigs. You know, it was like there was a core of like five or six producers that were making every single record. And there was guys like us on the outside going, hey, I can do that. You know, but you weren't, you know, it was going to the same five or six guys all the time. And great, we all wanted, we all wanted to be one of those five or six guys, but it kind of killed creativity. It killed it because, you know, you, you remember, if you listen to sort of the mid-90s when it, Pro Tools really exploded, the mid-90s records through to like even probably about 2008, 9, and 10, it almost sounds like the same record in a lot of genres, especially in a lot of rock genres. I think a lot of people... Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt no, you. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I think a lot of people had trouble harnessing the power. Uh, and plus, it was something that was just so new. Yeah. And now... I think the trick is we have all this power and we have all this, uh, this ability to, to do all these crazy things. And now it's just all about making the right decisions. And I think, um, there's a lot of young impressionable people out there who learn how to auto tune vocals, or maybe they learn how to record guitar parts that they could never actually play. And there's a responsibility to making sure that this power is used responsibly responsibly by those people because i do see a lot of people especially my scene uh making songs that they can't play and i'm you know they come to me for advice and i say the first thing is like how are you going to present this because what you just showed me in recorded format is something that a band probably can never do live on stage uh so you better have a good plan for how this is going to work yeah 
Yes. You know, I, I, I know there was quite a long period. I don't, I don't know if it's still around where the drummer programmed either on addictive or easy or whatever, programmed the drum parts and didn't even ever play them. And then he's, you're right. It's coming up to, you've made the record and now you've got to go and tour it. And you're like, yeah, but your kicks go, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a little bit of an in, insanity in there. Um, but I've seen that with all levels of bands. It's not even so much of the heavy, the heavy bands. It's like, look, and there's also a, an element of creativity that is wonderful in that respect. The fact that you can break down some barriers and do new stuff. But you're right. I think the the next set <coughs> responsibility is to figure out. Okay, if you wanna you wanna program the most insane drum part ever, go into your uh, little studio and practice six hours a day till you can do it. Which is actually kind yeah, of yeah. And I've been fortunate to work with like people who are willing to accept that challenge in some cases where you know I might be working with a drummer and I'm looking at the drum parts. It could be the opposite where the drum parts are way too simple and I and I'm saying. You know, this calls for something much more uh, challenging, something that's a little bit more uh, interesting in, in the craft of playing drums. And, and when I bring that up and I show them how much cooler it could be or, or how much more interesting it could be, uh, you know, they really kind of take that with stride and they'll go. I've seen people really make a huge transfer, transformation just in a matter of six months after working with me. I might just make these crazier fills or these these really intricate drum beats and then uh, i love to see those people go after that and, and try to learn how to play them in a live format and then by the time they come back to me uh for the next album or something they just have such a uh, more of an awareness of what they're doing in the band and that makes my job easier in some cases i completely understand for me I, I've definitely seen that with, with working with bands. One of the things I love is when you work on somebody's song, like the songwriting aspect, and you teach them some basic kind of transitional tools, you know, um, you know, that five sound great going back to ones, you know, like basic stuff that they've maybe heard in a hundred songs, but never sort of learned. You tell them, you teach them some tools in songwriting and yes, they come back, they do album number two with you and suddenly their songwriting has gone like this. You know, yeah. they're, they're able to set up the choruses. The choruses come in with an impact. And it's not just the production. They're actual, like, you know, understanding of melody and harmony. It's great. I mean, that's, that is a joy in what we do, that we're able to help people and help them be focused. And, it, you know, because to me, it's like that's the biggest part of our job, I think, when we're working with artists is to keep the focus, especially for you, because I work probably – I work with a lot of bands, but I also work with a lot of solo artists, a lot of, you know, which is fun for me because I get to play. But when I do work with bands and you've got a room of, and you know where I'm going, four, five, six, you know, 19 to 25 year old guys, I mean, wrangling everybody's, you know, <laughs> keeping the focus is a big part of what we do. I think it's all about creating an environment that um, fosters uh you know, uh, high quality, high standards. Sure. Um, that was my big thing to really instill in people is to say, you know, it's just not good enough. And if you really can get into that mindset, then you know what it takes. And I also do the same for, for like producers and mixers. They'll show me a mix and I'll be like, have you listened to other recordings lately? Cause this does not measure up to that. And, uh, the more and more I feel like you reference uh, what's going on in the scene, um, the more stronger your palate becomes and the taste Agreed, that yeah. you have, which enabled, yeah, and in inevitably enables you to make better decisions when you're, you know, working on stuff. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so you've got all these different arrows to your bow, feathers to your butt, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I can't feathers, even know. To, feathers to my arrow feathers maybe. to your yeah. arrow maybe you've got all these different <laughs> things and and you're, you're splitting your time up with a lot of different stuff um what hmm, is a big question where you and we were talking earlier about you know you're moving to la which i can understand coming here to get some uh, some sunshine i don't know about you but i don't really tan so i've been here a long time and this is about as brown as i'm gonna get uh, i've got the classic <laughs> string um, I think, um, so your message of bringing like this amazing amount of education, which I think is 
incredibly admirable and it's 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 very close to my own heart is it is to educate people and like i was saying earlier a lot of it comes to a little bit of a stick it to the man kind of mentality for me because i felt like for the longest time it was almost like a what do they call that the ivory towers kind of thing it was like everybody the gatekeepers were it was it benefited them and didn't benefit music so i think what i'm sort of touching on is because i always say for me creativity is king for me it's like I want to get an artist, whether a band or an individual, and I want to tap into what makes them great. Because in my understanding, my humble opinion in music is all of the great music that we love in any genre never came from any kind of establishment. Whether it be the Beatles signed to a comedy label or Nirvana coming out on Sub Pop, it wasn't like, I'm not going to mention any major label names, but it wasn't like a major label driving to you in Michigan and going, you're terribly talented. I'm going to make you a famous producer. It always comes. And I think that that's something that I, that's a message I want to try to get across because I find for me that there's a lot of dogma and a, and a lot of kids, not even kids, but a lot of people that are doing music. They, they, um, they don't feel empowered. You know, they don't feel like they're being encouraged to be creative. So I just try to always remind them that even the biggest songs of the last 10 years were all done in a very humble way, you know. So I love your message. I think it's absolutely uh, um, wonderful and, and mm. empowering is a, is a big word. I'm glad you used it. It reminds me, every, it reminds me to think about that every day when I'm talking to anybody. Um, mm. Well, we're going to put the links to Joey Sturgis Tones below. Nail, is it Nail the Mix? Yeah, nailthemix.com. Fantastic. So tell me a little bit more in detail about your plugins. I know, you know, Stephen Slate lives down the street from me, of all people, you know, and so I, I get, I've got to know him and his plugins through familiarity, but give me more detail of what you're doing, because I do love this. I'm good friends with Colin, Colin McDowell. I'm sure you know Matt DSP. And I love when he came out in the late nineties, it felt like it was like this, the birth of the sort of a boutique approach. And I feel like that is the new future. I love it. You know, you're living permanently in the, you know, basically in the present and the future because it's the sort of level of creativity, getting out of the sort of dogmatic approach of just emulating a Poltec or something like that. Um, because that's great. Because a guy like me who grew up going to a studio where there's a Poltec loves, oh, I can boost 60 hertz, I can do a 10K lift, whatever. That's all great. But now guys like you are making plugins which you've been using plugins and you're like, because you grew up making records in the box. So you're going, yeah, that's nice as a Poltec, but I needed to do this. I needed to do that. I needed to do all these other functions. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing with your plugins. Sure, exactly. Uh, kind of what you said is exactly right. You have all these manufacturers trying to make the perfect 1176 recreation or you know, oh, look at this API EQ. We modeled the curves exactly right. You know, proportional EQ is like the most amazing uh, recreation of the hardware. And now, now you can have a thousand instances of it without having to buy a thousand rack units and all this sure. stuff. That's cool. Um, but I wanted to take it one step further because in in software we can kind of do whatever we want. We're we're sort of limited by our imagination, and I wanted to take a compressor and like manipulate the guts of it and see what kind of new compressor I could create, for example. And that's Absolutely. that's a perfect example of uh, our, our best-selling plugin, which is called Gain Reduction. It's a vocal compressor. Um, you often see engineers piling compressors on top of each other uh, to sort of get this serial compression thing going on with their vocals just to get it sound just right. And I wanted to see if I could tackle that problem with just my own uh, design. Nice. And uh, once I did that, I my eyes sort of opened. And I was like, oh, I see, uh, I see a gap here. I see something that no one is doing, creating new tools that do interesting things and not necessarily having it be something that requires uh, a bunch of engineering skills or technical knowledge. I wanted to be able to create tools that a guitar player could use on on his drummer's uh, drum demo, right? right. Uh, you know the drum the drummer sends him a drum demo. It's like, hey, dude, put some guitars over this. And the drummer's like, man, your snare sounds whack. Let me 
let me uh, put the Transify on it and turn a couple of knobs. Oh, now it sounds better. Right. Um, that's sort of what we're after is to try and, and help everyone be able to get access to like cooler sounding recordings and without having to learn what ratio and threshold means and all this stuff. Right. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you ever so much. I really appreciate it. We're going to put some links uh, below for everybody and probably Chiron's in the, uh, in the video itself. I really appreciate your time. Um, it's great to talk to you and I love, to me, you're on the cutting edge of what is great about our industry. And I love, you know, I know I keep talking about it, but I love this great leveling now and the ability to empower any musician or anybody with any musical aptitude whatsoever or even need or want to make music. It's amazing. You know, we can take the most basic devices and make music now. And that's sort of kicking down the barriers, the, you know, getting rid of the gatekeepers and opening it up to everybody is, is a really important thing for me. So I love the fact that you're pioneering and really pushing that forward. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, thank you so much for having me on the show. Marvelous. This is going to be a great episode. I really appreciate it. And Okay, everybody, have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Um, please leave any questions and comments below. I'll try and pester Joey to answer some of them. <laughs> sure thing. I'll be right there. That's fantastic. I appreciate it. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate it.